just take a, just be a little bit further away if you can. We want you on the camera, but we but we don't want you to be too close to anybody. So if, if you can see her, that's that's good. Um, welcome, uh, everybody. We've gone to, I think, a pool camera, which we appreciate. Uh, we have a few folks with us today that I'd like to introduce. Uh, first of all, we um, are announcing our new COVID-19 relief fund. One of the two co-chairs, uh, Rick Sapkin, is with us here. Uh, we have Sarah Andrews, uh, who will be coordinating our state volunteer effort. She is a chief of staff at the Office of Economic Development, normally. We have Michelle Barnes, the executive director of the Colorado Department of Human Services, and we have Mike Johnston from Gary Community Investments, uh, one of our key nonprofit sector partners uh, on this. Um, I, we just rolled out yesterday our new uh, coronavirus COVID-19 webpage uh, that's on our governor's site. It's covid19.colorado.gov. Uh, if you're having trouble accessing it, it's getting a lot of web traffic. Uh, we're scaling up its ability, but it, it does work uh, most of the time if you're, you know, try again in a few hours. This is our effort to get more accurate information dynamically updated. So again, we're going to be moving away from just, oh, here's an update once a day to just as, whenever we have information uh, that we can make public, we want to make that public as quickly as possible. And that will be done on the covid19.colorado.gov site. It's really an important resource for the public, for the media, to get the latest information, the latest guidance. Uh, as soon as we have something that's presentable, it will go up there. And again, any issues associated with too much traffic will be resolved in the coming hours and days. Uh, as of this morning, we have 183 positive cases, two deaths. Uh, 20 hospitalizations, uh, just under 2,000 completed tests. I want to praise our team for scaling up and making Colorado a national leader in testing. Uh, I'm also sad to announce our second fatality yesterday uh, in Weld County, uh, which uh, also underscores the need to protect, in particularly our most vulnerable people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, those with underlying health conditions. To be clear, everybody's at risk, but there are significantly higher risk factors uh, for people with underlying health conditions and uh, older Coloradans. Yesterday, the Larimer County Department of Health announced a positive COVID-19 case in a resident of a long-term care facility. Uh, as you know, we've taken significant additional steps around nursing homes and long-term care facilities regarding limitations on visitation uh, and monitoring of anybody who works in those facilities uh, as well. Uh, and really what we want to do today uh, is urge everyone to do our part. Uh, a lot of people are asking me, what can I do? Uh, most people uh, are, are healthy. Uh, some are at home when they didn't plan to be. Some are going to work in a fuller limited capacity. Uh, but everybody wants to do what we can. In addition to practicing social distancing, washing, washing our hands, people are saying, what else, what else can I do? Uh, I also I want to thank the thousands of Coloradans in that vein that have become part of the viral social media campaign, hashtag doing my part, CO, sharing their stories about how they're doing their part. It's really been uh, heartwarming to see what so many Coloradans are doing uh, to help show best practices uh, around preventing the spread of this virus. And that, that kind of exercise is also important for our own mental health, doing good deeds, uh, engaging with people uh, uh, virtually when we can engage with them in person is really important. Uh, I know that there's families hurting uh, and it brings a sense of comfort that we're going through this together, we'll get through this together, we're doing the right thing together, and we will be back together. Coloradans are good-hearted people and we have a lot of need to put that good heart to use in this crisis. So we're going to talk about three ways that Coloradans can help. Uh, first, we are putting together a relief fund. Today we're formally announcing the Colorado COVID-19 relief fund that supports prevention, impact, including helping people who've lost their jobs, and ultimately recovery efforts. I'm very proud to announce the co-chairs of this effort, Roxanne White, uh, who was uh, Chief of Staff under Governor John Hickenlooper, and Rick Sapkin, a respected uh, businessman, both very well-respected community leaders in Colorado. I'm also proud to announce that my own Deputy Chief of Staff, Danielle Oliveto, uh, is being detailed to that effort. And I want to thank Mile High United Way, our fiscal sponsor, for this critical effort to help Coloradans. 
In just the last uh, two days, we've raised over $2.8 million. That's a remarkable achievement that really shows the generous heart of Coloradans and will make a difference for those who've lost their jobs and are facing real difficulties. And that number is going to grow. Uh, because I want your help as well. Please visit www.helpcoloradonow.org if you're in a position where you can make a donation of $5, $50, $500, whatever you can afford to do. Uh, partners from various sectors have already stepped up to do their part. I want to thank uh, the Denver Broncos. I want to thank uh, Kent Theory and his wife, Denise. I want to thank the Colorado Health Foundation. I want to thank Rob Katz and Alana Amsterdam, Wells Fargo, many, many others. And that information uh, will be available to the press in terms of who is helping. Uh, and we really hope that the rest of the corporate philanthropical, the corporate and uh, philanthropic community will continue to step up to make sure that we have those flexible resources. Uh, the nonprofit resources will always be more flexible in their use than public resources, state or federal, and to really have those resources to meet that very real need and very real pain that people are feeling who have lost their jobs, who are trapped at home, who don't know what to do uh, for their kids. And that work will really fall into three main buckets, prevention and impact. And then as we get into it, we want to keep our eye on recovery. On the prevention side, that means that this 2.8 million, which is rapidly growing with your help at helpcoloradonow.org, will support medical supplies, nursing home staff coverage, cleaning supplies for care facilities, homeless shelter staff coverage, cleaning supplies. Uh, and on the impact side, we want to focus on how we can help Coloradans who've been directly impacted, uh, not the medical side, the directly impacted in terms of job loss, weather this storm. That means supporting people who have worked in food services, uh, it means helping kids, older Coloradans, and others in need. It means early childhood education availability so that our critical sector workers in healthcare and first responders can continue to work. You know, child care is especially important if parents are receiving intensive treatment. Supporting technology that helps Coloradans connect with one another, connecting for work, telecommuting, but also connecting social, socially. Uh, again, so important when we're not able to be in one another's physical proximity that we support efforts to bring us together virtually. We also plan through the impact fund to help small businesses, impacted small businesses, and of course the hourly and part-time workers uh, and, wor and, and, and full-time workers that uh, are temporarily uh, losing their opportunity to support their families. The impact fund will support behavioral health which we know will be a big challenge, particularly as people are asked in various areas in various ways to hunker down and minimize their social contacts, and also support our volunteer services, which I'm going to expand upon uh, in a minute. And finally, I want everybody to know that this will end, there will be a recovery. Uh, this is going to get worse before it gets better. But we will keep our eye on the ball in planning with impact funds for our recovery, which means small business recovery efforts to get the economy back and people back to work, mental health and substance abuse support for our most vulnerable, and continued use uh, and support uh, ongoing continuity for medical supplies. Again, if you'd like to help, please visit helpcoloradonow.org. And I know that Coloradans aren't just financially generous. Not everybody is in a position to be financially generous. We're also generous with our time and our effort. Now, we've been inundated with requests of people asking how they can help. So we're launching our official volunteer effort at Help Colorado Now. So again, if you can't donate money, please consider donating time. Sign up to volunteer at helpcoloradonow.org. It'll ask you about your skills and what you're able to do and what you'd like to do. Uh, and we will be coordinating that effort uh, with our volunteer agencies, nonprofits, and others across our state. The efforts being led by Sarah Andrews, who is the chief of staff at the, Economic, at the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. We're particularly looking for volunteers to help at-risk individuals in a wide variety of areas of support. It could mean health care assistance. It could mean food delivery. It could mean mental health, wellness support, child care services, so much more that we're going to need. So uh, if you're able to help financially, please do. If you're able to help with your time, 
uh, uh, and your effort. Uh, please sign up to do so as well at helpcoloradonow.org uh, to make sure that we're all rising to this occasion. I want to challenge Coloradans to do our part, each and every one of us, to help us all get through this together. By working together, we can build a cohesive network that makes sure that no one falls through the cracks during this difficult time. So please visit helpcoloradonow.org. Sign up to be a volunteer. We also need volunteer leaders if you have experience managing or organizing. And let us know what your, or, what organization, what your organization volunteer needs are. Uh, one final ask. In addition to the need for funding of volunteers, we have a need for blood donations. There were a number of blood drives that were canceled because of the social distancing, but there are still safe protocols for giving blood. People can go in and have a time and do that. And blood banks have reported a sharp drop in donations at a time when we are likely to need more blood. Again, not keep in mind what's happening in the medical system. Many of the COVID patients don't need blood, but we have everything that normally occurs as well. We have people with heart attacks, with appendicitis, with all of the injuries and, and, and conditions that we normally need to treat. And so we can't experience a drop off in our blood supply during this crisis. Uh, we also want to clear up any misinformation. Donating blood is safe. Uh, you shouldn't be at all concerned about giving uh, blood during this time. And again, while it's not needed for the coronavirus treatment, it's needed for all the other medical issues that crop up that can't simply be crowded out because of coronavirus. People won't stop having their life threatened with other life threatening conditions that need blood. So please visit. Uh, uh, V-I-T-A-L-A-N-T dot org, Vitalint dot org. Uh, also consider uh, calling uh, the other centers. Uh, we will have their, their phone numbers for you. Uh, they're in the press release. There's a centers in northern Colorado uh, as well as elsewhere that are taking blood. But please, uh, uh, Vitalint dot org to find where you can give blood near you. Uh, so that's what we need, donations, volunteers, and blood, I hope that almost all of you have one of those three things. There are certain people who can't give blood if, uh, if, they're, uh, if they have uh, communicable diseases uh, or they're ineligible. But if you can give blood, do. I know not everybody can give money, uh, of course, but if you can give money, uh, please help coloradonow.org. And if you have time and a skill, uh, we need you. A few more updates to share with you. We know that this crisis uh, is very is about to put an enormous strain on healthcare and emergency workers. We know that about 80,000 emergency workers have children under age eight, and without childcare, many of these workers simply won't be able to perform the jobs that are crucial in lives and is containing the spread of the virus when they're most in need. So I've called together a group of early childhood providers, advocacy groups, school districts and foundations to partner with the Colorado Department of Human Services to establish a system of emergency childcare for essential workers to make sure that lack of childcare is not holding back our healthcare workers and first responders and those that we need now more than ever before. Uh, here's who qualifies, healthcare providers and staff. That means doctors and nurses, yes, but it also means all hospital support staff. We need the maintenance workers, the janitorial staff, everybody who's essential to maintaining our health system. Uh, we are scaling up the child care for you. It means public safety workers, firefighters, police, EMT, correctional officers. It means the staff that support our critically at risk population, those who work in long term care facilities, residential youth facilities, 24 hour residential care facilities, mental health facilities. So for the first two weeks of this program, child care will be provided to these workers on a sliding scale to make sure that uh, people can afford it uh, to access this benefit so that we can retain our needed workforce. And we hope to continue uh, to offer this benefit uh, on a, a based on our ability to fundraise and access federal funds. Both of those are occurring. It is one of the, the goals of the impact fund. Uh, I want to thank Mike, Mike Johnston for really stepping up from Gary Community Foundation to help spearhead uh, this effort on both the financial planning piece and the delivery piece. Uh, it's absolutely critical that at a time we need our first responders and healthcare workers and support staff the most, uh, the people uh, aren't forced to stay home simply because their kid doesn't have a place to go during the day. For more information, please visit covidchildcarecolorado.com. That's covid, C-O-V-I-D, childcarecolorado.com. Again, thanks to Colorado Department of Human Services, Gary Community Investments, uh, and so many others that are working hard to put this effort together successfully and immediately. 
Now, I know that yesterday's announcement, the closure of major gathering spaces, including food and beverage establishments, is already hitting small businesses, workers, our entire economy. Uh, so I want to talk about that for a moment. We're making unemployment insurance available to Coloradans who are dealing with the loss of wages due to that crisis. That's immediate. I know that the unemployment insurance system is experiencing a high load of claims. So again, that website, like that other website I mentioned, has been intermediate. People have gotten through, they have registered. But if you're experiencing trouble, I would encourage you to try it early in the morning or late at night when the load is lower. Uh, but uh, we are working on scaling up that website so it can conduct more simultaneous transactions. And we expect claims to increase as the virus takes a larger toll on our economy, uh, not just in Colorado, uh, in America, and of course, globally. We have a patch on the website to deal with the high volume. We're shifting more of our workforce to this call center to also assist in that area. Uh, again, be patient. You're not losing eligibility just because you can't get through to that website or call center at that moment right now. Uh, try again, again, particularly during the uh, lower uh, traffic hours. We also sent a letter to the Small Business Administration asking for relief for our small businesses here in Colorado. We're specifically asking, along with our congressional delegation, for the SBA economic injury disaster loans in a number of impacted areas. And we're continuing to press our federal delegation and the Trump administration to do everything they can to make businesses whole here in Colorado. We'll be announcing in the coming days additional steps around supporting workers and small businesses and economic relief. And I also also call upon our federal de get delegation to act immediately to pass relief measures. I strongly support efforts to put $1,000 a month or $2,000 or more in the hands of Coloradans, uh, as well as beefing up some of our uh, pro social uh, safety network programs that support those most at risk. Uh, I think uh, this is the time to act quickly at the federal level, uh, and I strongly encourage Congress to act. Uh, the federal government is able to borrow money at a historic low rate interest rate, uh, roughly 1% last time I checked on the 10-year T-bill rate. Uh, it's the opportunity to deploy that money immediately to prevent an economic crisis for those who have lost their jobs in the food service industry uh, and for all those who are suffering in this time, injecting cash into the economy, getting it directly to people quickly uh, can make a major difference in the economic recovery and trajectory of this separate from the public health ramifications which we all uh, care deeply about and of course are focused on every day here in the state of Colorado. I want to conclude today by thanking everyone who's taking this seriously. And more importantly, um, again, for taking this information in stride with urgency, with importance, but not with undue anxiety or trepidation. We've been tracking this for weeks and months. We've been following the recommendations of our public health experts. We've been learning from the experience of other countries. But consider this hasn't even been two weeks since we've got our first case here in Colorado. And look how quickly and drastically things have changed. Uh, things that we took for granted just two weeks ago can no longer be taken for granted here in our state. We will get through this. Uh, we will return to good times, but we're going to get through this together by talking, by sharing, by being prudent, and by showing precaution, uh, not by letting anxiety and fear overwhelm us. Um, how are we going to get through this together? You know, I know there's serious kitchen table issues that many families are facing right now. It's one of the reasons I've called on the federal government to act to uh, infuse, uh, get some money out to families, uh, particularly those affected, but all families that are suffering. And I know that we're dealing with a public health disaster on the one hand, and we're dealing with a volatile economic situation on the other hand. Again, a volatile economic situation, not just in Colorado, but nationally and internationally. Now, I want to be clear, we have to address the public health issue. And you'll continue to see additional guidance requirements in the coming hours and days with regard to containing the spread of the virus. Because if we fail, the economic consequences of the virus running rampant will be far worse in the medium and long term. This will be difficult. But this will also be temporary. Eventually, things will return to normal. The vast majority of us, as many people as possible, are going to be just fine. And we're going to take the steps we need to avoid 
catastrophic loss of life for those who are needed in urgent care because of the COVID virus by flattening the curve of the spread of the virus. Look, there's nothing perfect in any response. Nothing is ever perfect. Uh, I can't promise we're going to get everything right, but I can, what I can promise you is that our team, our medical experts, those who we pulled into this effort and detailed into this effort, and everyone involved with this effort, are going to keep our shoulders against the wheel and we're going to press on uh, and do everything we can to balance all of these competing factors uh, until we reach the other side. Uh, we are addressing the public health issue and getting, again, ahead of this curve by taking the actions we took around restaurants and gatherings and other precautions in the next few days. I know that there's a social political piece as well, meaning how long and what can people endure? And yes, an economic piece. An economic piece now for families who need to put food on the table and an economic piece in terms of what we need to prepare for a robust recovery and we'll have more details on that in the coming days as well. Most of all, I know that we will make it through this together. Thank you and I'd be happy to take some questions. We want to scale up testing as fast as possible. I, I, I hope that they're not going to DIA to get out of here. We want them here in Colorado. So uh, we, we uh, if you would connect us, Joe, we would be happy to take 100,000 test kits and deploy those as quickly as possible. We, we would rather they don't go to DIA and out of the state. Governor, some localities in the state are talking about shelter in place. Is there any discussion about shelter in place in any community? We're, we're looking at all of the public health options that are on the table for the appropriate deployment to minimize the spread of the virus. Uh, there's a number of steps that have been taken, and uh, you can expect additional steps in the coming hours and days. Some are being taken by county health departments because of uh, Summit in Gunnison County is an example of taking additional steps, uh, and some are being looked at for the state. Yeah, we're looking at every option to make sure that uh, Coloradans don't lose their, their home or their housing or have additional instability during this crisis. Uh, it's absolutely critical. I think that, uh, again, landlords know what's going on too here. Uh, they generally want to keep good tenants and they generally know that if, they're, if their tenants are out of work for a month or, or two, they need to work with them if they want to be able to keep them there. But yes, we're, we're working on, on ways to do that uh, and making sure that during this period of time that eviction orders are, are not uh, processed the way they normally are. Yeah. yeah, actually that's more than just rural, rural hospitals, that, that's really all, all hospitals are really uh, doing a couple things, uh, using telemedicine where possible, especially around screening, but also uh, moving uh, uh, and, and canceling and delaying elective procedures. Now that's tough because it's always a question of what's elective. There's things that are clearly elective that you can reschedule, there's others that uh, you need to get done but might be able to be put off a matter of weeks or months. So with all of the providers, rural, urban, suburban, uh, we are in contact with them and working on how we can best manage the caseload during this crisis to make sure that those have critical care needs unrelated to coronavirus can continue to have those met, as well as the surge capacity for those who might need treatment, including oxygen or even ventilators for coronavirus. What? Oh, ventilators? Yeah, we have, th that's one of the things that we're most worried about and why we're taking these strong social distancing um, uh, steps to avoid the spread of the virus that overwhelms our ability to provide the last line therapy, that's ventilators. Keep in mind there's many intermediate steps, that's the, uh, the most drastic, but um, oxygen treatment uh, and other, other forms of treatment. So uh, again, we're, we're, we're focused on doing what we can to bend this uh, epi curve to delay and slow the spread 
to prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. Based on these actions, again, as we've seen in other places, I can't guarantee that our hospitals won't continue to be overwhelmed. But we're doing our very best by, in a timely manner, a specific manner, a well-orchestrated manner, uh, rolling out this public health guidance and orders. So we, we are um, uh, doing everything we can to acquire more PPE. It was the topic of my conversation with the Vice President yesterday, uh, at, at a staff level yesterday. Really at every level uh, we are engaged in that conversation. We're looking at where else PPE resides in the state. And yes, many providers are looking at protocols for, uh, for reuse or continued use, uh, including sanitary ways of ensuring that the virus isn't spread. Well, the numbers uh, today are not overwhelming our, our health care system. The, as I mentioned at a previous press conference, so the problem is we're chasing a ghost. We're chasing where the virus was seven to ten days before. It's about seven to days, seven to ten days uh, from exposure to hospitalization, sometimes even longer. So what we're worried about, who was exposed to the virus three days ago, four days ago, uh, especially before some of our additional social distancing measures went in, and we will be expecting additional caseload at the hospitals in the next few days. I, I want to keep the focus also on what people can do, because people should get all this information, and they will, and we're being as transparent as possible, and you can check out our regular COVID site. But if you want to help, please visit helpcoloradonow.org, because most of us are healthy. Uh, a lot of us have, have needs, but some of you have the ability with time, or financial, or your blood, uh, to be really be able to help the state weather this crisis and save lives. So please visit helpcoloradonow.org uh, and sign up as soon as you can. If the website's experiencing traffic difficulties, again, write it down and try in an hour or two, helpcoloradonow.org. I hope, I hope it's experiencing traffic difficulties because I hope 10,000 of you right now are signing up. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, please try again in a couple hours. Uh, we are expanding testing rapidly as we can. We uh, have pulled private sector expertise. We just inserted um, uh, Matt Blumberg into our command structure, who will be coordinating the testing scaling effort. His deputies are Casey Wolf, who normally works in the governor's office, and Kyle Brown, who normally works at the Division of Insurance. Uh, because of the lack of, of supplies, there's really three pieces of testing that need to gear up. One is supplies, uh, and that means testing supplies, but also, uh, also PPE. The second is personnel, uh, which we have deployed the National Guard around the logistics for testing. The 50 nurses that the state have hired have already hit the state and are engaged with that. Uh, and the final is the processing, which I also, again, have very good news on. It's gearing up quickly. Uh, through Roche is coming online with UC Health. Uh, there's additional testing labs in the state that will be up and going in the days ahead. Uh, remember, the, one of those limiting factors on the processing has been the majority of the processing, vast majority, has been LabCorp and Quest, which have three to five day turnaround, and, and actually, in actuality, it's often more like four, five, even six day turnaround, because we're not the only place that are sending them tests. So we're very excited that some of our providers, uh, UC Health, Children's, Kaiser, the ones I know of, uh, that will have that ability uh, for test processing in the state. In the coming days, I'd like to say, uh, I guess worst case is weeks, but uh, I, I know that's all coming online very likely in the coming days or week uh, with many of those private test processing facilities here in Colorado, which is absolutely critical. Big difference between 24-hour diagnosis 
and five-day diagnosis. And it's not, not just around the health. I mean, the patients are being treated, right? I mean, it, it's not so much around the health, but it's around conserving PPE, right? If the patient doesn't have it, you no longer need to take all those same precautions, and there can be protocols that don't waste medical supplies. So we want those diagnoses, and also in terms of tracking the contagion and limiting the contagion, that 24-hour turnaround is so very important. So all these things are very important, uh, and that's why we are focused on scaling that. So uh, all of the school districts where there have been any incidents of the virus are closed. We have issued guidance around closure. If the virus were to appear in any of the school districts that remain open, they would need to close. And of course, we're continuing to look at the additional statewide social distancing measures. Um, we want to set expectations again with the schools. There will be uh, additional actions in that area. Uh, and while it's possible that school might return this year, uh, it's increasingly unlikely. Uh, and that's why districts are turning to online and virtual education. Uh, uh, there'll be additional work uh, out of the Colorado Department of Education and us and guidance in this area. But we want to make sure that just because in-person learning uh, is suspended in most, if not all, of the state, that doesn't mean that learning is suspended. We still have those teachers. We still have great staff. We still have the kids who need to learn. Uh, and we want to make sure they don't sacrifice uh, a, a quarter of a year, a third of a year of academic achievement and that they're all ready for advancement to the next grade level academically. Oh, I have one more thing on education, sorry. We did suspend, and I, I, for those of you who follow education, you know that I'm very supportive of accountability, uh, of the information that comes in from testing around where learning gaps are, what successful strategies are to reduce the achievement gaps. We are suspending all of those testing and accountability measures. There's, uh, again, in a crisis, in an emergency, we can go without that for a year. While, again, uh, that sets back our overall accountability accountability work around improving the schools that need the help the most, uh, taking a year off from that clock is a small price to pay in the scheme of things for the work that needs to be done around social distancing and saving lives. Yes, continue. Say that again. So again, we're, ho we're hoping that folks step up at helpcoloradonow.org, blood, time, money, whatever you got, we need it. Uh, the more we come together, the more we help. The, this is clearly going to have a long economic tail. I think to reduce that, we need federal action immediately, getting money to people, uh, whether it's $1,000 a month or $2,000 or some some proposals that are more, uh, whether it's help that's specific to those in food services. Uh, I'm for all of those things. We're going to be amping up our own state uh, work on relief over the next few days as well. But any large package would need to come federally. We strongly support that. Uh, from the public health perspective, uh, the data is still being gathered. Our state epidemiologists and our medical team are giving me updates every day, every other day. Uh, the picture is changing, but it encompasses all of those trajectories that you've likely read about from best case to worst case. Uh, we're doing what we can with the aggressive social distancing, the additional public health work today, last Last week, next week, uh, that's going to do our best to reduce the trajectory of the virus contagion in Colorado, save lives, and limit the economic damage. We don't have what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there was no there was no central registry of ventilators. So, I mean, I, we, we certainly have a sense, and as we find things out, we're happy to share them. Uh, the major providers know what they have. I think what uh, what you know what what there's no overall inventory of is some of the regional and critical care hospitals that they literally have to be asked, and they would need to inform us what they have. Uh, there's not like a central registry, but uh, I, I think that there should be able to be at least fairly accurate estimates of the number of ventilators that are presented to the press. You know, if not today, then tomorrow, and those should be very accurate. Uh, again, there could be, they could be off by a few, but I, I think there'll be a high level of confidence that those estimates will be close to the mark.
Well, there's three components that go into testing, and I'd like people to sign up to help at helpcoloradonow.org. Helpcoloradonow.org will help with blood, if, you, if you're eligible, with money, if you have it, with time and skills, if you have it. Uh, please help with all those things. Uh, there is important uh, diagnostic work being done in the high country. Uh, we have a much higher rate of positives in some of the counties uh, that have been the epicenter of the viral outbreak in Colorado. Uh, there's been additional social distancing uh, measures taken in Summit and Gunnison. Those are being looked at for other hot spots that are affected, uh, and we're doing our best with the limited health care capacity that those areas have. Uh, we're trying to aggressively engage in social distancing seen in those areas to prevent further contagion. Governor, looking for greater details on my shelter in place question. Do you anticipate any community in Colorado calling for shelter in place in the next 48 to 72 hours or so? So I would probably need to call my legal counsel for that. Keep in mind that Denver is a city and county, um, not a traditional mayor. Uh, county health uh, uh, offices have that ability. Uh, I, I don't know whether whether um, a, a, a statutory township mayor does offhand. I, I would just say that all of the additional social uh, distancing measures that are applicable are being looked at balanced with, again, how long can people endure them, sustain them, uh, what is the effect on the economy? If there does have to be for some short period of time a shelter in place, what's the, uh, the highest leverage time to do that? Uh, to limit the spread? Uh, because we know that you, you, can't, you, can't, uh, you can't shut down everything forever. Uh, and when people are, you know, again, we don't know when there'll be a vaccine, we don't know when there'll be a cure, but we have to make sure that we have it in a way where there's compliance, where there's social order, uh, where people can support themselves. And so uh, looking from a public health perspective first, Colorado's been very aggressive in these social distancing measures. Uh, you can expect additional uh, supplementation, uh, as you have seen every day this week, I believe. You'll see more in the next coming days. Uh, the restaurants and the bars have closed. Uh, additional effort is being done uh, both regionally in the areas that are uh, hot spots as well as statewide around really reducing the spread of this virus to the extent that we can by limiting social distancing. But I want to be clear, that responsibility is on people at the end of the day. There's not really ability to police if you're stupid and you have 30 or 40 or 80 people at your home. I mean, maybe the neighbors will complain and maybe the police will come out, but please don't be stupid. Engage in social distancing. The new guidance is no more than 10 and up. The state, your local law enforcement, is not going to be everywhere and anywhere. It's not something you're trying to get away with. What you're doing is you're jeopardizing the lives of your friends and their families and their relatives. So be smart here. Again, socialize, but socialize virtually uh, on FaceTime. Call your friends, conference calls, use uh, the online applications that allow for groups of people to talk. Don't, don't be dumb here and think you're getting away with something just because uh, the cops aren't able to shut you down. Uh, you're actually being really dumb if that's what you're doing because you're jeopardizing the lives of everybody who's attending that event, your very friends that you care about. So be thoughtful about this social distancing. I know that many faith congregations are, uh, their ministries are converting to online and digital and telephonic. You know, I had a call with faith leaders the other day, and it's, uh, it, it is particularly challenging because often in these crises, after 9-11, if there's fires or floods, it's the very times when people want to come together in our communities of worship, in fellowship. Uh, but by the nature of this crisis, we can't have that physical proximity. That doesn't mean that we can't have virtual proximity and we can't be closer to one another, but it's going to have to be online and telephonic, calling your friends, engaging in conference calls, uh, asking your place of worship about what accommodations are being made, and they're being very responsible about how they're uh, conducting this. So uh, please visit helpcoloradonow.org. Uh, we'll take one more question before we finish.
Yeah, DIA is exempt from these orders. Uh, it's it's uh, under a different authority. Uh, we would have the same concern with DIA that we would have with anywhere. The, the concern is the social distancing, right? If you're six to eight feet from somebody, you are safe uh, from everything we know from the medical side about the viral transmission. I really hope and I, I'm confident that if this is enduring for a longer period of time that we have social distancing protocols that allow more and more businesses to operate. So again, in the short term, the social distancing is likely to get more severe, you'll get additional guidance. But if this is going to be endured, if we're going to get through this, we need to figure out how to accurately and correctly do social distancing while allowing as much normalcy as possible. So that first step is the extreme social distancing, the orders of the last few days, the coming work, the work of the counties like Summit and Gunnison in that area. But that second round of work will be how can we have as much normalcy as possible while without sacrificing the public health. And that will mean how can we ensure and enforce adequate social distancing in dining and other establishments at a limited capacity, a very limited capacity. We're not there yet. Uh, we need to act now. We need to act boldly. But we also want to figure out what's sustainable for weeks or months. Uh, hearing uh, the different trajectories of the likelihood of this. Please visit Help Colorado, please visit HelpColoradoNow.org. I really suspect that almost everybody listening can either help with money, it might be five dollars or a dollar, it might be a hundred or five hundred, or with time, particularly if you have the ability to help with child care or other areas that are in need or uh, you're a recently retired paramedic or nurse that's willing to come back into the workforce. Uh, and with blood, if you're eligible to give, uh, we need to make sure that we're able to address uh, the ongoing need for blood that saves lives every day here in our state. www.helpcoloradonow.org. We're going to get through this together. The days ahead are not easy, uh, but there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there will be a recovery on the health side and the economic side. In the meantime, let's all work together and show that true Colorado strong spirit uh, in making sure that we can help those most in need among us and save lives by continuing to prevent the spread of the virus. Thank you.